I've reviewed two of these books so far and both times I opened with how amazingly beautiful these books are. The first volume had a Green Ranger theme, the second volume had a Red Ranger theme, and the third volume? Why, it's based on everyone's favourite ranger of course, the Poo Brown Ranger. Wait, what? What do you mean there's no Poo Brown Ranger? Then why have Boom given me a book that looks like a shit stain on my shelf? As the saying goes, all good things must come to an end, and this, my friends, is the beginning of the end. Everything, the front cover, the spine, the back cover, and the interior pages, all looks like it's been smeared with shit. I can't for the life of me work out why. This volume is clearly based on Draken, and he went from being white to black. Why they decided the cover should be brown is beyond me. Sure, they're probably saving white for the necessary evil hardcover, which is going to look awful with white writing, let's remember that, and Beyond the Grid has been announced and it's based on the Ranger Slayer, so it's a pinky purple theme. So why couldn't this book have been black to match Draken's final form? That's not the only disappointment. Where Year 1 opened with a foreword from Jason David Frank and Year 2 had a foreword from Austin St. John, the Shattered Grid Deluxe Edition hardcover gets an opening from… no one. They've dropped the foreword altogether. There's also no afterword like the previous volumes had either. And did I mention the book is thinner? Not a massive amount, but enough to notice when it's on the shelf next to the others. Why is it thinner though? Surely two pages of foreword and two pages of afterword wouldn't make that much of a difference? They don't. Where Year 1 and Year 2 had all the content that was in Lost Chronicles Volume 1, I had expected Shattered Grid to have at least some of the content from Volume 2 in it. The Shattered Grid hardcover does contain the 2018 annual and the free comic book day issue and the exclusive story promise to keep, but it misses out on the anniversary special entirely. Now, I do understand why this is called Shattered Grid, so they've only included stuff that's directly relevant to the storyline, but this did make me wonder that since the next hardcover is beyond the grid, will they include the anniversary special there if it's not included here? The answer is yes, but no annual is included, nor a short story. This is the downside of not having the books continue as years 3 and 4 and instead tying them to events. Things get missed because they don't fit with the book thematically. Year 1 and 2 had all the extras and nobody had an issue with it. Why not just call this year 3 and include the extras? Why change it and remove stuff? There are a couple of other changes, the first being that we no longer have the Saban logo since they've once again sold the rights this time to Hasbro, so that's the logo we get, and they've actually included a recap section, which is where the end of issue 24 comes in. Well done to Boom for that, it's always handy to have a couple of pages just letting people know where they are in the story, and I believe I mentioned that in my review a year too, although this only recaps the Mighty Morphin stuff, it doesn't include the Go Go stuff, which seems weird considering things that happened in that series are explored more here like Matt and the Ranger Slayer. So all in all, the third hardcover is not as deluxe as it should be, which surprises me. Boom had been doing so well. I had been hoping they'll pull their socks up with Beyond the Grid, but that looks even worse in terms of what's included, but I'll talk about that at the end. The Shattered Grid Deluxe Edition hardcover has an awful colour, less content, and no foreword or afterword. It's not a great start. Having said that, the main event itself is fucking awesome, and that's the most important thing. The main part of the book is the Shattered Grid event, which collects Mighty Morphin issues 24 to 30, the Free Comic Book Day issue, the 2018 Annual, and Go Go issues 9 to 12, so that's 12 issues altogether, although issue 24 doesn't really count because they've only included the end and not the full issue. The book opens with the Time Falls Rangers examining a rip in the space-time continuum, and as Jen leaves the Megazord to examine it, the energy from it seems to destroy the Megazord, while Jen sees a giant figure, which we know is Draken, reaching through the tear to grab at her, and she manages to time travel and escape just before he manages to grab her. You'll see this image again at the end of the story as well, this is a part of the mirror image in the book has. Meanwhile, in the present, Draken has gone to Ninja to trick him into helping him fix his broken warfare, telling him that in the future they're friends and fight on the same side of a war together. So Ninja helps him reactivate the morpher, but the moment he's done, Draken turned on him. Before Draken turns on Ninja though, he asks him about the people who created the Morphin Grid. Ninja may have created the coins to access the grid, but he didn't create the grid itself. It turns out there are things called Morphin Masters and they control the Morphin Grid and we'll see them later on. Tommy and Kimberly finally get it together and go out on a date, but once she goes home, Draken comes out of nowhere and stabs Tommy right through the chest with Saba. Kimberly morphs, Jen appears at the other end of her time jump and together they drive Draken off, but the damage has been done and Tommy dies. It's quite interesting when he dies because his last words are, so that's what she meant, it's okay Kim. 
When you read it at the time, it makes no sense, but this book has a lot of time skipping, universe jumping, and overall timey wimey stuff in it, and it will make sense later on. Draken returns to his alternate future, and the first person he goes to see is Finster 5, a mix of Alpha 5 and Finster, and his relationship with him really reminded me of Tommy's relationship with Finster in Soul of the Dragon. I thought that this was interesting because Soul of the Dragon is part of the show's continuity, not the comics, and I hadn't expected to see it here. After Tommy's funeral, Jason takes on Tommy's dragon shield, which I thought was a nice nod to the show, and Jen explains that the morphing grid, which connects all the ranger teams, sensed danger, so to protect itself, it split, isolating each ranger dimension, hence the name Shattered Grid. This stops all time travel and interdimensional travel, but Billy and Trini manage to use Jen's morpher to teleport the rangers to the Super Samurai universe when Draken attacks it, and they manage to rescue Lauren, the Red Samurai Ranger, but the others were captured, and with the knowledge he's taken from Ninja and some technical wizardry from Finster 5, Draken uses one of the Samurai Morphers to absorb its power, upgrading his ranger powers and slightly modifying his costume. This is another similarity to Soul of the Dragon because just before that was released there was an episode of Super Ninja Steel called Dimensions in Danger that served as a prequel to the comic which had an older Tommy Oliver crossing over to the Ninja Steel universe using multiple ranger powers just like Draken and there was even a crack in the universe. There's no way that's a coincidence. In fact, later on, in a four or five part issue, Draken does in fact end up travelling to the Ninja Steel universe. The 2018 Annual is up next and it's a five part issue that focuses on Draken getting more morphers by really starting his push and crossing over to more dimensions than ever before. The first part is set in the Zeo universe and shows Jason leaving the team, so the Zeo rangers give him his original morpher as a present and we see Tommy and Jason have a heart to heart on top of the command centre and once they're done, Tommy teleports away during the party and it's revealed that it was Draken using a hologram projection to look younger so he could infiltrate the team and learn why everyone respects Tommy so much and still Adam Zeonizer. When he's thinking about it, he stops, claiming it doesn't matter and kills Tommy with Saba. All of these little stories have a moral that ties in with the end of the book, and for this one, it's that Draken doesn't understand and won't accept teamwork and love. The second part is set in the SPD dimension and opens with Kruger explaining B team beat C team because of teamwork when Draken attacks their dimension. And you can see his costume has changed and taken on aspects of the Super Samurai costume since absorbing the power of one of their morphers. SPD manages to drive out Draken without their powers, and the dog guy hammers home it's because of teamwork, so just like the Zeo story, teamwork is the lesson here. In the RPM universe, Draken's forces invade Corinth, and while the rangers are fighting Draken's forces, Draken himself has a conversation with Dr. K, their leader, telling her that he wants her to join him because he admires her for wiping out 90% of the population, then keeping the remaining 10% safe. I guess in the RPM series, the leader of the good guys actually accidentally created the bad guys. I don't know, never seen it. Anyway, she calls him a psychopath and blows him up, but it turns out it was never really Draken. He was talking through Avengix Android. The lesson of the story is the value of life, especially in other people. In Space is the next story, and TJ is in a mood about not having any missions, so Andros orders him to fix the airlock, when Draken sneaks aboard the Astro Mega ship and takes control of Decker, assaults Alpha 6, and ambushes the rangers in their sleep, demanding their morphers. I always thought they said let's rock it, as in R-O-C-K-I-T, but when Andros morphs, he says rocket, like a spaceship. And it does make sense since it's literally in space, but I think rocket is cooler, and I wonder what everyone else thought it was. TJ remotely orders the Astro Mega ship to transform for some reason, and I have no idea why since I don't see what difference that would have made to the events happening inside the ship. Draken finds TJ, who jettisons himself to space to protect his morpher, but not before Draken cuts his oxygen feed, and I'll talk about that later. So TJ floats off with no oxygen, presumably to die. The lesson of the story is teamwork, again. Nobody was communicating, nobody was working together, and that's what led to the Space Rangers' downfall. Ninja Steel is the last story, and after losing his ability to morph because he split his morpher to beat Galvanax, the Red Ranger decides to make a new morpher by splitting it again, which I don't understand, although it does say when he originally split it, it made three more Red Rangers, so maybe he's using one of theirs? This not understanding key events from multiple series is exactly what I was afraid would happen by expanding a mighty morphing comic to other series, particularly the newer ones. 
Draken appears to steal the Morpha, but the Red Ranger splits it again. Although this time there are no new rangers created and the rest of the rangers turn up and Draken runs, but it turns out he has a piece of the broken Morpha and orders Fince the Five to melt it down so he can have it remade. The lesson? Teamwork. Again. Come on guys, it's Power Rangers. They only ever have three lessons. Teamwork, love and don't pollute the environment. All these stories really do connect with the end of the story and they are interesting and do a good job of showing Draken beginning his final push to invade every dimension. But again, if you don't know these series, you might be a little lost, like I was. I don't know most of them and I don't know any of the history from their shows. And while Shattered Grid is very similar to Crisis on Infinite Earths, here you literally won't know anything about the alternate universes without watching the shows. If they'd have done a parallel comic series that explored these ranges, I would have bought it, read it and been much better prepared for these kinds of stories and in turn, I would have got a lot more from the stories. Sadly, there isn't, so I didn't, and that's a misstep in my opinion. The stories don't go on for too long, so it's not a massive deal, but this is what I didn't want to happen and makes me wonder how Beyond the Grid will treat this stuff. We finally get the first issue with Gogo and it starts with Kimberly in the world of the Coinless and she's running from Draken's men along with Bulk and Mrs Appleby and I thought her introduction was pretty good because the first time we see future Kimberly she's in the same pose as the Ranger Slayer. In the present, which is the regular Gogo timeline, which means before Mighty Morphin, Kimberly's parents get divorced and Jason finds out his dad is ill, although they don't say exactly what he's got, and he hasn't told anyone about it. The Ranger Slayer is introduced, like I said, in the same pose as Kimberly. She battles the Rangers and reveals herself to be future Kimberly, which was obvious which is why her introduction pose was identical to Kim's. I thought it was a nice touch to have Kimberly see her worst possible future in the Ranger Slayer after swearing not to be like that because of her parents. Later on, Rita searches the Ranger Slayer out and we see she came to free Draken but arrived too early. And as she's communicating this to someone using something glowing with green energy, Rita arrives and offers to help her power her Zord, which I thought was really uninspired, to be honest. It's made of the Red Dragon Thunder Zord, the White Tiger Zord, and the rest is just grey, flat, may as well be a Transformer. There's an interlude, which is actually the 2018 free comic book day issue, and it follows Zordon, who is confirmed to be a sage, as he travels to talk to the emissaries at a great cost to himself, which turns out to be not being allowed to live in the Morphin Grid with the three other emissaries when he dies. He hopes to convince them to get the Morphin Masters to intervene and stop Draken before he gains so much power that he can do real damage to the Morphin Grid. It turns out the Morphin Masters are the creators Ninja was talking about when Draken asked him at the beginning of the book. The emissaries refuse to even ask the Morphin Masters, claiming that Zordon's champion should be powerful enough to stop Draken and that they don't involve themselves in such trivial events as corporeal wars. This prompts Zordon to recount the Rangers' bravery, which means the comic finally gives in and retells how the Rangers first got their powers. And it's an interesting sequence because Ernie finally appears in the comic. We see Tommy's first appearance, and it also shows that after the battle in the world of the coin list, Draken killed Rita on top of the command center. I thought this was done quite well because it was done in a very ancient Greek son rising up against the father, or in this case mother, kind of way. The issue had some really great art, it was very ethereal, especially with the emissaries constantly changing ranges, I thought that was very cool. Back in Mighty Morphin, Skull is introduced in the world of the Coinus, and acting as a spy, he's gained the rank of a Red Sentinel in Draken's army and rescues alternate Zack who somehow got captured since we last saw him in the battle against Draken in year 2. Dr. K from the RPM world works out how to counter Draken's demorphing tech on his dragon cannons, so Jason and Lauren head there to rescue her. Zack, Trini and Billy head to the world of the Coinless, where they meet up with the alternate rangers and Bulk and Skull, and alternate Zack tells them that Draken has Ninjor under a spell, which is how he's able to absorb the power from other morphers. So if they can break the spell on Ninjor, they can beat Draken, but the main rangers don't know who Ninjor is yet, which I thought was a nice touch and shows Higgins really is a fan and knows his timeline. Meanwhile, Draken arrives in the RPM world with the Psycho Rangers, which I completely didn't expect, so that was cool, and it made me look forward to reading the Psycho Path, which I still have to buy. We go back to Gogo, and in the world of the Coinless, there's an interesting conversation between Bulk and Kimberly, where it turns out Bulk has always been a bit of a history buff, and his favourite lesson at school was history, but he always kept it a secret. I liked this because it reminded me of an episode of Zeo, I think it was, where Skull turns out to secretly be this master pianist. 
There's a nice moment where Bulk thanks Gimbley for all the time she secretly saved the world as a ranger, and as they're scouting Angel Grove, I thought it was a nice touch that they called Draken Sentinels by nicknames, Tusks for Mastodons and Kitties for Sabertooth Tigers. It just made the characters and the world seem a bit more real. I also noticed that Draken surrounded the high school with a moat, and this represents his feelings of isolation that led him to join and stay with Rita. Past Bulk bullies Billy, just like in the show, but this time, when he goes to throw a water balloon at him, Skull asks him not to, and this ties in with them being best friends as kids, which we saw in Go Go Volume 1, so I liked the way that was included here. But the joke's on Bulk, because when he throws it at Billy, Billy catches it and throws it right back in Bulk's face. <laughs> Matt's totally got the wrong end of the stick because he's convinced he's central to the battle between Rita and the Power Rangers, and Kimberly tries to talk him out of it, but he's fixated on the idea and dismisses the possibility that he's just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jason asks Zordon for help fixing his dad, but he refuses because of some bullshit about protecting humanity, but really, it's just because he's a dick. Although, there was a nice reference to the moon landing fight with Grace and the previous Power Rangers because he mentions how he sent people in his charge to their deaths. And we know at this point, Gogo -Go exists in the same timeline as Mighty Morphin, so even though that event was in Mighty Morphin, it's still canon to Gogo -Go and still happened in 1969. For some reason, when Billy and Trini are in class and their communicators go off, Trini checks her phone instead of her communicator and that made no sense to me. Sure, she might want to check what the problem is, but that's what the communicators are for. When have they ever replied to Zordon or Alpha 5 and they haven't told the rangers what's wrong? It turns out the ranger slayer Zord is attacking Angel Grove and we discover it's called the Grave Sword, presumably built from all the dead swords we saw in the battle in the future when Draken takes the command center and kills Jason. It still looks shit. <laughs> no matter what it's called, it looks shit. I don't even know what Zord the claws on the left arm come from, nor the wings, the helmet, the sword spear thing that's under the red dragon Zord on the right arm, and those shitty, shitty, completely uninspired and practically colourless legs. Anyway, the Ranger Slayer invades the command center since she still uses her original power coin, and she does something to Zordon which incapacitates him, then turns on Alpha 5. There's a classic image, absolutely classic, of Rita's giant eye as she looks through the telescope, which took me right back to watching the show as a kid, and Kimberly realises the Grave Zord is a distraction, so she teleports to the command centre, and Matt sees the fight between the Zords, and stupidly tries to get their attention, and it doesn't end well. The next issue is Mighty Morphin, and it starts with Kimberly and Jen travelling to Terra Venture to rescue the Galaxy Rangers, and on the way, Jen explains that because she can't travel any further back in time to the point where Tommy actually became Draken and stop it, she's worried that as the future adjusts to their presence and effects on the past, that even if they can save the future, it might not be their future as they remember it. When they get to Terra Venture, Corone is the only one left, and they take her aboard the Pterodactyl Zord, even though they were expecting it to be Kendrick's, and since she's all beaten up, Carter, from Lightspeed Rescue, gives her a look over, and it was nice to see so many older Ranger teams come back, since up till now, apart from Jen, all the teams that have been introduced are more modern teams that I know of, but aren't really familiar with and have never watched. I went up to Time Force, and I'm re-watching Time Force now, that's where my Power Rangers ends. Anything after that is unknown to me, so it's nice to have the earlier stuff back, especially since the Mighty Morphin comic is aimed at fans of the earlier series, it just makes sense. The Battle of Corinth continues, and it's getting crazy, and bit by bit Dr. K is trying to upgrade all the Rangers Morphers to make them immune to the Demorphin Dragon Cannons, and when you see Draken, you can see he's had another upgrade, because his costume now has the Zeo lines on his shield. In the world of the coinists, Zack, Trini, Future Zack and Future Trini all sneak into Draken's lair to free Ninjor, but as they're escaping with Ninjor, Future Zack sees one of Draken's sentinels aiming at Arzak, leaps to push him out of the way, and dies. This was a bit sad, because just before they snuck in, both Zacks had a nice moment together where Future Zack was catching up on whether his advice about being honest about Rita's offer from Volume 2 worked, and he also had a goal to finally stop fighting and rest once they beat Draken. I should have seen it coming from a mile away, because when happy things happen, bad things immediately follow it, that's how writing goes, but I didn't see it coming, so I was pleasantly, but sadly, surprised. Once they escape, Ninja tells the rangers that Draken isn't conquering rangers for their powers, he's doing it to get inside the Morphin Grid, and the last thing we see in the issue is Draken looking at a green crack in reality that closes pretty quickly, with Draken saying, soon. So presumably, it was Draken attempting to access the Morphin Grid, and even though he can't do it yet, clearly he's amassed enough power to start accessing it. 
In the GoGo timeline, future Kimberly finds a doctor tending to Matt, and that doctor is drawn exactly like Billy, but apparently it isn't Billy. But look at it, it looks exactly like Billy. Anyway, he's tending to Matt, but he sustained heavy wounds trying to fight off an entire group of sentries by himself, and he dies because Matt's clearly just fucking stupid. And Kimberly, wrecked with grief, tells Bulk to take the survivors to Trini's mill, which we'll see in the extra story later on in the book, while she goes in and puts an end to Draken once and for all. Back in the present, our Kimberly manages to electrocute the Ranger Slayer, but not before she sees Matt from the transmissions she's getting from the Grave Zord. And when she's beaten, there's a green spark that pops in her chest, freeing her from Draken's control, and this in turn causes the Grave Zord to shrink, so I'm guessing it's partly based on Draken's Black Dragon. Both Kimberleys go to the juice bar, and since it was destroyed in the future, the now reformed Ranger Slayer has a hell of a day out. But just as she's totally relaxed, Matt walks in and it really throws her through a loop, and as she steps outside to collect herself, Draken appears in a portal, and in terms of the timeline, this is the Draken we've been following in the Mighty Morphin comics the one that's embarked on his great campaign, and Draken realises that whatever mind control he had over future Kimberly has now gone, and he leaves her forever. So now, there's Draken from the future interacting with future Kimberly from Gogo, -Go, meaning he's affecting multiple points in the timeline, making this not just a war for every ranger's morphers across dimension and linear time, but a full-blown time war in multiple points in time, like in Star Trek Enterprise or Terminator. He's now affecting events before he first started affecting events, which creates a whole mess of continuity, like why don't the Rangers know of the Rangers layer in Mighty Morphin? But Higgins has done very well here, he answers the questions. In Mighty Morphin, it turns out somehow TJ survived Draken's attack on the Astro Mega ship. Don't forget the last time we saw him, he was floating in space with no oxygen, and he wasn't Morph, but he survived apparently. Anyway, he's in Rita's Moon Palace with all the other captured rangers. All the rescued rangers and their accomplices are hidden in the pocket dimension discussing plans, and Ninja explains that Draken is trying to enter the Morphing Grid by increasing his resonance to it, and this is why he needs at least one Morpher from every team. Each team accesses the grid differently, so the more teams access points he has, the wider his access becomes. His tower in the future is transmitting a signal across dimensions that allow his army to access the grid, and the combination of both is tearing holes in every reality, breaking the walls between them. There's a nice Return of the Jedi reference at the Battle Plan meeting, and for anyone who didn't get it, it's the big round table with the hologram. Andros comes out of nowhere in a ship and lands next to the command centre, so he's part of the team now, I guess, and I have to wonder how the Rangers rescued TJ, but not Andros, because that's never explained, and it really should have been. After all, the last time we saw them, Draken invaded the Astro Mega ship, and TJ jettisoned into space with no breathing apparatus, and Andros was still on the ship while Draken was walking around. So why did they rescue just TJ, but not Andros? That doesn't make sense. We see Draken's conversation with the Ranger Slayer from his point of view, and I'm really not sure in either version why the Ranger Slayer's helmet was removed, whether she did it herself or Draken forced it off, but you can see this time that it was Finster 5 who was influencing Draken and pointing out Kimberly's errors like not having a bow and questioning Draken. Just as before, he ends the conversation and, knowing that they have Ninja and Dr. K and what a threat they could be to him, chooses to accelerate his plans. There are a few nice moments in the command centre, with Corone talking to Andros, who it turns out is from before they managed to save Corone, which is a big relief for him, so he's like peeking into his future a little bit, and Commander Kruger expressing his sorrow to Zordon about what Draken did to his sixth ranger, and I like this because I can't recall a time when the leader or mentor, or whatever you want to call it, of each ranger team actually spoke to another one of a different team. As they're planning to travel to the moon to attack Draken for the last time, Grace says they can use a ship she's designed, which turns out to be Terra Venture, although she didn't know its name until Corone tells her. She had been calling it Promethea, so this is what the Promethea project that Billy would have worked on was always about. So even if Billy hadn't become a Power Ranger here, the chances are if he'd stayed on the Promethea project, he probably would have met the Lost Galaxy Rangers down the line. Alpha sends a signal across dimensions on how to counter Draken's dragon cannons and teleport, and there's a cool splash page where the rangers teleport in from other dimensions, and it reminded me of Forever Black, but the art was so sparse here, the double page spread seems almost wasted, and to prove it, the very next page is filled with all the rangers that arrived, including the first appearance of the Beast Mall for rangers before the show aired. Seriously, this scene looks so much better in Forever Black. 
Zordon believes Rita is their only hope and we see her in the throne room and it's changed and has cogs like in Zeo but there's no explanation for why. Seriously, the Machine Empire hasn't been in the comics at all so I really have no idea why they've swapped out her classic stone castle with the fan spinning look for the cogs and it left me scratching my head as to why they did it without any explanation. Back in the Go-Go future, after the death of Matt, an enraged Good Kimberly fights her way up Draken's tower to kill him and this is when he first mind controls her using a spell Rita had taught him before he killed her and this is the first time we see her called the Ranger Slayer. In the present, Jason forces his dad to sit down and talk to him and his mum about his illness and I thought the way he took control of the situation against his dad's wishes while also convincing him it's the right thing to do was perfect Jason writing and showed off his leadership skills really well. It's really cool seeing the rangers in the Megazord cockpit because they have holograms which I hadn't noticed them in the reboot so far so either I've missed it or it's new, either way I liked it. There's even a little battery bar from a phone for how much power the Megazord has left which I thought was really funny but also a nice touch because the rangers are teenagers, you know the socialites, they use their phones all the time, they know exactly what that bar means so it makes sense, I thought that was a nice inclusion. Before the rangers headed out, Matt had been texting them and they were too busy doing the hero thing to answer him and since nobody told him not to go, he headed out to watch the fight again just like last time because like I said, he's stupid and he's still convinced he's the centre of everything and on his way to the Megazord fight, Matt runs into the ranger slayer and the shrunk down Gravesword and recognises her as Kimberly's quote cousin from the juice bar and she apologises for not telling him the truth. The rangers are getting battered and while she's talking to Matt, the ranger slayer sends Gravesword to help the rangers and they form Mega Gravesword and the design is okay this time. The Sabretooth, Tigerzord and Triceratops Sword add more colour to the legs. It has a tail and wings, but I, I didn't like that and it had no Pterodactyl Zord. Has claws everywhere, three on the right wrist, a dagger on the left wrist and another set of three claws sticking out from its right shoulder for some reason. And overall, it looks like Mega Angemon from Digimon. The Ranger Slayer isn't piloting the Gravesword, instead she seems to have gone to kill Tommy before he became the Green Ranger, and in a fight with him, she shoots him in the heart with a green powered arrow which disappears and says she's not trying to kill him, she's given him a second chance, which leads to this very cool collage with his green helmet, which kind of shows Tommy's journey as a ranger and ends with an image of the white ranger at the bottom left and the angle of the helmet and the way it was done with scenes flowing around the edge really reminded me of the cover of Soul of the Dragon. I think this is the first time we've seen the White Ranger in the comics and it's pretty cool because it kind of foreshadows the necessary evil arc. I mean, we all knew the White Ranger would be in it eventually, but it's still a nice tease. The Ranger Slayer disappears along with the Gravesword and appears in an alley with her powers failing and Grace Sterling turns up and offers to help her. It seems in her conversation with Matt, future Kim told him everything about her and the others being rangers because the very last thing we see in the issue is Matt walking into the juice bar and confronting the rangers about the truth and when they don't admit it he walks out the door seemingly forever so that's something I'm looking forward to in volume 4. I probably won't be reviewing the trade of volume 3 because everything that's in volume 3 is in this book it's basically the go-go shattered grid so it's pointless me buying it and reviewing it but I am looking forward to volume 4. The next issue of Mighty Morphin has this really funny scene where as Jason is given a speech we see the rangers getting ready in the command centre and the Magna Defender from Lost Galaxy is there chatting to the Phantom Ranger from Turbo and he says, so you're a helmet kind of guy huh? And the Phantom Ranger just replies with yes. <laughs> We also see Billy and Trini working on the Black Dragon armour with what looks like future Trini inside it which makes sense since present Trini has already piloted it. We see Bulk from Hyperforce which I thought was great because that makes Hyperforce canon. Hyperforce was too long for me to watch and I'd love like a condensed half hour or hour long episode that kind of recaps everything that happened in Hyperforce or if they released a comic based on Hyperforce that would be brilliant but it's nice that Hyperforce is recognised as canon to the comics. It's also shown that since Grace approached the Ranger Slayer in Go Go, future Kimberly hasn't gone anywhere that we know of, so I do wonder exactly what it is she's been doing there. We know she couldn't time travel because of the way the grid shattered, um, but it does show Grace has learned nothing from all of Jason's warnings about keeping secrets, especially from the Rangers. 
It was really nice to see Jason's speech transition from the past to the present where he's addressing all the rangers they've rescued outside the command centre and it's cool to see them all lined up with the Megazords behind them, especially the Mega Dragon Zord and the Shogun Zords on the right. His speech touches on how Draken may have their abilities but will never be a part of what they are and this ties into the final battle. It was an exceptionally cool moment in the sunset which looks awesome with Jason wearing the dragon shield but since Lauren convinced him he would be best on the front lines as a symbol of hope and leadership he decides to give the dragon shield to Kimberly so she can pilot the mega dragon sword which was really really cool and if you have time I absolutely recommend you check out a video I'll leave a link I'll pin it in the comments section um, to Power Morphicon 2018 when they did this live reading of this issue and it's wicked they've got a load of the famous famous actors, one of the Ritas comes back to voice her, Paul Schreier's there, Kyle Higgins is there, and the crowd, when Jason gives Kimberly the Dragon Dagger, they just go, <gasps> and it's very cool, it's very cool to watch, and I get why they did it, it's, it's one of those moments where it's just like, that was a cool moment. All the rangers teleport to Draken's moon to fight him for the last time and Jason and Lauren have a nice moment where she says they're really glad they met and this is definitely a romantic thing but I thought it was odd that they were talking on the moon with their helmets off and this is especially bad when you consider the fact that they pointed out in year two when Grace goes to the moon and in Go Go Volume 1 that the helmets are what let them breathe in space. The battle is epically huge with all the rangers and their zords taking on Draken's sentinels and tanks and then Draken appears on the field and he's melted down Saba with the ninja star from earlier and merged them and created a new sword that allows him to steal and absorb the rangers morphers with just the sword meaning every time he kills a ranger in the battle he takes one step closer to his goal making him incredibly dangerous. Then. Serpentera appears out of nowhere and eats the OG Megazord showing just how big he truly is. Kimberly shoots Draken with the Dragon Dagger which causes serious problems with his powers most likely because as was explained earlier in the book absorbing more than one morpher from a set is dangerous and Draken now has two green ranger powers inside him. He retreats to the palace where he finds Rita, Zordon and Kruger burning the green candle which I thought was brilliant because it's the way Rita removed his powers in the show and the people that read these comics are more than likely to be the people who actually watch the show so it brought in that lore without needing any explanation at all. We all knew instantly what it was. Seriously, that was good writing without being overly fanservice-y. This also explains what Rita was doing in year 2 when she went to see the Wizard of Deception. She was getting him to build the candle and if you look very carefully you can just see the candelabra at the bottom right of the page and that means they'd inserted a way to deal with Draken over a year before this issue. And again, that's impressive writing. It's been set up properly if you know what to look for and isn't some deus ex machina that's come out of nowhere. Unfortunately, the candle turns out to be useless because Finster 5 comes out with Lord Zed's staff and shocks everyone except Draken, who orders Finster 5 to merge multiple morphers from the same sets, many sets in fact, with Draken. Finster 5 refuses because he loves Draken too much to risk his life like that and Draken snaps his neck showing that while on the surface it looks like he cared for Finster 5 the way Tommy cared for Finster in Soul of the Dragon, he really truly has no idea what love is. He then proceeds to merge himself with every single morpher he has at once. The final issue in the book is double sized and my god it's so good! <laughs> Three years of storytelling converge here and I have to say Higgins has done an exceptional job. This is a crisis level issue, as in DC Crisis. Despite setting up the green candle over a year ago and bringing it back, Higgins hasn't used it as the final way to beat Draken and I'm glad he didn't because in this issue, Lord Draken wins. He beats the Rangers. They failed. The issue opens with Jen using the Time Force archives to use the schematics of the remaining Ranger Zords to combine them into a new multi-team, multi-dimensional Megazord and incorporates the Black Dragon into it so it can grow and while that Zord, having grown, takes on Serpentera, Jason uses Noah's Curex Zord to attack Draken's tower but Serpentera breaks free of the new Megazord and seems to eat Jason and I think he really did eat him, I'll explain why in a second. Then it happens, Draken, having finally absorbed enough morphers and their power, appears as a giant in the sky complete with a wicked new black costume and breaking reality. 
I think this is the moment we saw at the beginning of the book with the Time Force Rangers because he was a giant there too and reality was breaking. And if this is the breaking point of all of reality, there's no reason why it shouldn't appear at every moment of time. The world fades to white and the next thing we see is the human versions of Rita and Zordon doting on Tommy and Kruger is there as a proper dog when the city comes under attack from ghostly looking energy beasts. Tommy flies off to meet them and when he does the Superman shirt thing he has a red diamond in his chest like Mr Sinister has on his forehead and we see the other rangers piloting Tommy's old swords. Jen is in either the Dragon Zord or the White Tiger Zord and as Tommy flies in and attacks the ghostly forms it seemed obvious to me that these were some of the powers Tommy had absorbed that he didn't deserve and weren't given to him. It's like the power was fighting back. He took them against their will and they aren't happy about it. The first two are a white tiger and a white falcon and later on we also see a bear, an ape and a wolf which were the spirit animals of the yellow, red and blue rangers respectively in both the movie and series 3. Apparently I'm wrong though and I'll talk about that in a second as well. Tommy defeats them and he gives an interview to Zack and Trini who are now reporters writing puff pieces about him and it couldn't be more obvious at this point that when Draken absorbed all the Morphers and broke reality he did it so he could rewrite it in his own image where he's the hero and everyone loves him. Despite all his power he can't tune out these visions of the real Tommy that appear in reflections mocking him for being a weak one that in all the many realities and all the different Tommies he was the only one to go bad. As Draken loses his temper we can hear what I thought was the other rangers talking about how he's getting weaker but it turns out it was the emissaries and as Tommy focuses we see his fist shatter outwardly from a dimension within some glass and it looks so cool because you know everything's about to change and the whole idea of him punching himself into a different reality reminded me of Superboy Prime's punch in Infinite Crisis not to mention the fact that it just looks so cool like Tommy's just so powerful now. We see the main rangers in this new reality all noticing something odd and one of them is Jason and this is why I think Serpentera did eat Jason because that was before Draken rewrote reality. So when he got his powers Jason was dead but when Draken rewrote reality he brought Jason back not knowing that he was dead so this is another Jason brought back but nobody knows this. As the rangers in this reality all noticed something odd, the last one is Kimberly who works at the juice bar and it's Tommy approaching her and asks her to remember. He transfers some green energy to her forehead and she remembers everything, his death, his funeral, the war with Draken, the moon, all of it. As it turns out when the ranger slayer attacked Tommy, she shot him with the green chaos crystal and when Draken killed Tommy, he was pulled out of reality, able to watch events but not affect them because he had the green chaos crystal. After Draken invaded the Morphing Grid, once the emissaries gathered their power together they worked with Tommy to reconnect the rangers to the Morphing Grid even though it's in Draken's world. The emissaries admit that they were wrong and that they should have listened to Zordon because when Draken absorbed all the Morphers during the Battle on the Moon he entered the Morphing Grid and defeated the emissaries then took what's known as the Heart of a Master, the red crystal he has on his chest. Based on the art alone it's hard to tell what the Morphin Masters are, they look like giant humanoid statues so I have no idea what their deal is but I think they're an interesting addition to the lore and I hope we get a story that delves into them in the future, especially considering one of the emissaries says that there was only one Morphin Master there with the whereabouts of the others unknown. That leaves plenty of room for more stories about the Morphin Masters. If you need any more convincing that this is a crisis story, just look at the layout of the planets as the emissaries tell the story. If that's not crisis on infinite earths, I don't know what is. Even Draken in the way his character functions in the story is like the anti-monitor wiping out all of reality so he can rewrite it in his own image which is what the anti-monitor was doing. I thought the energy beasts were representations of Draken's stolen power but Tommy says they're really manifestations of his self doubt which is just fucking stupid like the guy beat all of reality every dimension and I get that he has personal issues like he feels inferior which is why he's doing all this but if these energy beasts aren't going to be the power fighting back then why draw them in as known animals that represent the power white falcon white tiger ape you know that sort of stuff. That's silly, if you wanted it to be his self doubt then make it like a black mist or something. Don't make it something that is connected to the Power Rangers. Tommy says if they can take the heart of the master back then they can undo everything but as they're talking Draken finds them and attacks. 
Tommy morphs into the Green Ranger and manages to touch the heart, which takes him and Draken into a void, which I think is in their minds. Similar to how the final fight in Final Fantasy VII takes place in Cloud's mind, but it's still between him and Sephiroth. This was a good fight because it's just Tommy and Draken, the complete opposite of what most of the book has been about. Don't forget Tommy died at the beginning of the book, and then it was hundreds of rangers versus Draken. Now it's Tommy versus Draken, and that's it. Tommy beats Draken, explaining that despite his godly powers, his weakness was that he was too afraid to open up to let anyone in, in particular the five other rangers. This ties in with the annual that I mentioned earlier, the one with all the lessons, love, teamwork, all things absent in Draken that he tried to manufacture in his dream reality, but none of it's real because in his heart he doesn't have the ability to love, at least not on that level. With a final punch from Tommy, they return to reality, with Tommy having won the heart from Draken, and all of reality is tearing apart again. While the emissaries hold open a portal to the morphing grid, Tommy tries to save Draken, offering him forgiveness and redemption, but Draken, too proud, unable to love, and just having been taken down a peg, chooses to stay in reality as it's destroyed. So Tommy leaves with the emissaries and the rest of the rangers. The emissaries can't restore reality, they're literally unable to use the power of a heart of a master, so it's up to the rangers, and I loved this. Jason convinces them that even if they don't remember doing it, bringing back reality as it was before is the right thing to do, and Shattered Grid ends, with all the rangers using the heart, and as everything fades out to a new future, a new reality, and a new story, Kimberly says they're not saving the world this time, they're saving all of them. I loved this ending. The way the final battle with Draken wasn't physical was so good because it was always his character that drove Draken, and that's why he's such a good bad guy. I couldn't think of a better ending for his story than what we got here. I also love the cliffhanger and the way the Rangers are hopefully bringing back reality based on their memories because it reminds me of Doctor Who. My favourite Doctor is Matt Smith and at the end of his first season the TARDIS blew up and destroyed all of reality but he fixed it by using Amy's memories to rewrite reality and bring everyone back just like what the Rangers are doing here. This ends the story perfectly with the Rangers winning and reality being brought back, but it's also the perfect transition to the next chapter in the Rangers story. Whatever happens in Beyond the Grid will have a clean start, although I am curious how this will affect Gogo. This was Kyle Higgins' last issue on Mighty Morphin, and my god, he went out with a bang. The art throughout the book is okay, but not my favourite, especially considering Hendry Prosecha left the book halfway through year two. His art wasn't the most amazing art ever, but it really suited the comic and it was a bit more detailed and his lines were so much tighter. When he left, Jonas Shaft took over the pencils and Joanna Lafuente took over colours and it's just not the same, but also not different enough. It's like a more basic version of Prosecha's art. It's like they're trying to imitate his style, and it's really off-putting because Shaft's lines are nowhere near as tight, and Lafuente's colours are really odd. She has this obsession with highlighting things with colour that make no sense, constantly using pinks and oranges for highlights, or adding outlines in colour outside of the inking. Or when Kimberly and Tommy end their date, she has pink highlights in her hair, and he has green. Yeah, I know, they're the range colours, but I don't need that colour in their hair, they already wear the fucking clothes, the hair is pointless, it just looks really... odd. It's not all the time, but it's often enough that combined with Shaft's dodgy, lazy pencils, I notice and it stops me enjoying it as much as I did when Prosecha was on the comic. Fortunately, the GoGo -Go team hasn't changed, and I love the art in those comics, so everything is exactly as it should be in those issues, and I'm really not looking forward to the day Dan Mora leaves GoGo, -Go because just like Prosecha with Mighty Morphin, his style suits the comic perfectly. As usual with the Power Rangers comics, when something is set in memory or something like that, the art team changes, and the 2018 annual has different artists for every team's story, and they were all fine. Not amazing, but definitely not bad. The free comic book day special was penciled by Diego Galindo and coloured by Marcelo Costa, and I liked the change in style, in particular I liked the bold and vibrant colours used in the Morphin grid sections when Zordon is talking to the emissaries, and I know I said it earlier but I'm saying it again, the way they keep fading between different ranges was so cool. These two also did the art for Draken's alternate reality in the last issue at the end of the book, and Costa's colours have changed in that reality, having a much more muted pastel look to them. But it works because it's supposed to be Draken's paradise, it's not supposed to be in your face. 
So the art for the book overall was good, but not what I fell in love with originally. In fact, a lot of it seems to be a facsimile of what I love. And this is the first time I've ever really understood why people didn't like Eric Larson when he replaced Todd McFarlane on The Amazing Spider-Man, because they thought his art was too similar, like he was trying to copy McFarlane. And I get it now. The only extra story in this book is the exclusive story promised to keep. Unlike Year 1 and 2, Shattered Grid doesn't contain anything that should be in Lost Chronicles, and I find that very disappointing. Promised to keep follows on from the events of Chapter 8 in this book, which is Go Go Issue 11, and in that issue, Future Kim tells Bulk to take everyone to Trini's mill while she goes to take out Draken, and after he turns her, the first thing he did was send her to take out the rest of the coin list. It's an okay story, it fits in nicely, although there isn't much to it. Kim comes back, now the Ranger Slayer, and there's a confrontation between her and Bulk, until Trini comes along and uses a code to tell Bulk how to get out of there with the survivors. Then there's a fight between Trini and Kim, Trini shoots some barrels and escapes in the explosion, and Kim continues to hunt her. That's it. It gives a little backstory to what happened in the world of the coin list, and it was fine for the 10 pages it was. The book does include the 2018 Annual and Free Comic Book Day 2018 Special, and they were inserted into the main part of the book, so when you read them, everything fit in chronologically with Mighty Morphin and Go Go. But it's missing Anniversary Special 1, which was released in 2018, the same year as the Annual and Free Comic Book Day Special. But because it's nothing to do with Shattered Grid, it's been omitted. As usual, there's an absolutely beautiful cover gallery in the back, and it's almost as good as always, containing all the Mighty Morphin covers except the Shattered Grid Beyond the Grid, connecting covers for Baltimore Comic Con by French Carla Marno. I assume that since that's a connecting cover and extends to Beyond the Grid, that it, both of those covers will be in Beyond the Grid, but really, one of them at least should have been in here. I think it's missing the Shattered Grid number one finale slash Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issue 31. And I know issue 31 isn't in this book, so that's okay, but again, the first part of it should have been in here since that issue is in this book, so hopefully that will be in the Beyond the Grid hardcover as well. The book also has all the covers for Go Go issues 8 to 12, except the Paper Dolls covers by Audrey Mock. Why? Why, why have they left that out? And given that the book is a little bit thinner, why not include all the covers for 1 to 7? In fact, why not include all the covers that are supposed to be here? You know, all the ones I just listed. Another example of the decline in presentation is the chapter numbering. Year 2 continued the chapter numbers from Year 1, so it started from chapter 13, I think it was, whereas this book resets them to chapter 1. Why? Didn't anyone look at both volumes while they were making this one so they knew they were getting it consistent? I'm also a bit concerned about the binding in this book. When you look at the eye, it looks fine, but as I'm sure you've noticed, if it's showing up on the camera, that I can see the whatever the hell this stuff is that ties the pages together. I thought sewn binding was sewing stuff like cotton or whatever on the actual eye, and then the pages were glued to that cotton. So I don't know what these like ribbon things are that are going through the pages, but I can see them. I've read this book twice, once when it came out and once again to review it, and seeing it like this concerns me. So the build quality isn't great like it is on the other two so it's disappointing on paper it looks okay but when you actually get down to it the presentation of the book is not good after reading shattered grid and doing a bit of research i learned that beyond the grid is the next arc and is made of nine issues mighty morphin power rangers 31 to 39 and that's it no go go issues and after that it's necessary evil which is 15 issues starting with mighty morphin number 40 and go go 21 so I had been thinking that hopefully the next book will be Beyond the Grid and have Mighty Morphin 31 to 39 and Go Go 13 to 20, making it 17 issues. So everything continues to get collected in this oversized format. As I was writing this review, the Beyond the Grid Deluxe Edition was announced. Actually, Omar from Near Mint Condition alerted me to it. Thanks, Omar. And it will have the Ranger Slayer as the theme and will contain Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 31 to 39, along with the Anniversary Special number one, and that's it. 10 measly issues, no annual, no go-go, no exclusive story, which means that when Necessary Evil is collected in an oversized hardcover, there will be a gap between Go-Go issues 13 to 20, because this book ends Go-Go at issue 12, and Necessary Evil will start from issue 21, so 13 to 20 will be missing. 
I have no idea why Boom is doing this and it's starting to piss me off a lot. Why can't they just include the interim issues logo so people can have everything collected in one place? It's annoying having to have these hardcovers and the odd trade just so you can read it all, especially when you get to enjoy the oversized art in one volume then the standard sized art in the next, even though it's the same series. And 10 issues, is that a joke? Where's all the stuff that should be in Lost Chronicles? Where are the misadventures of Bulk and Skull, Babu and Squat, or hell, I'll make one up, Ernie and Lieutenant Stone? 10 issues, no exclusive story, no go-go to bridge the gap between Shattered Grid and Necessary Evil, and no Lost Chronicles stuff. Fuck off, Boom, now you're just taking the piss. At least it's not Pooh Brown, that's got to count for something, right? So overall, I feel like the story was excellent, even though there were a few things here and there that weren't explained, like how TJ survived, why they rescued him and not Andros, that sort of stuff. The art was good, even though it's not as good as year one or two, but the presentation has definitely declined, and based on what I've read about Beyond the Grid hardcover, this is just the beginning. In terms of the extras you usually get in these books, we got less here than in years one and two, and we'll be getting no extras and no go-go in the next volume. But credit to Kyle Higgins, he may have leaned heavily, and I do mean heavily, on Crisis on Infinite Earths, but it really works, especially with the new lore he's added and left open, like the Morphin Masters. Ryan Parrott has also done a fantastic job writing the story of the Ranger Slayer to fit in perfectly with the main event in Mighty Morphin without feeling like he's stepping on Higgins' toes, but let's face it, if you're the kind of person that reads one of these series, you're probably the kind of person that reads both. <laughs> If you've followed the comics to this point, I feel like if you've had enough, this is the perfect jumping off point. The Rangers won, Draken was erased along with his reality, and you can just assume the Rangers rewrite reality the way it was before. And I'm going to stick with both series, but this was Higgins' last run on Mighty Morphin, and I'm really sad to see him go because he's done such a more phenomenal job, stepping up the kind of stories that can be told about the Rangers, elevating them from campy, kiddie, monster of the week fun stories to crisis level tales and i wonder how good the following stories will be as someone who grew up watching the original series they have to be damn good to impress me 